your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way out. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters. Quell the voices inside. Transform me, Lord. Extinguish my pride. You've won the battle. I trust in your plans. Yes, God. I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally capable hands. You know, that perspective right there, that's some real perspective, isn't it? That is someone who has a relationship with God who sees the world around him so much differently, right? Like the way that he is looking at the world, that's really different. That, that right there is the kind of relationship that I want for each one of you to have. I want you to have that level of intimacy with God, that level of a relationship where you see God at work all around you in all of the things that are happening. Wanting a deeper relationship with God. You know, really that is what our series is about. And when you think about how do you get that deeper relationship with God, we talked about first, let's say level one if you want, embracing the universal good, that this world was created good for each one of us, that we all benefit from the good things that are on planet Earth. We all breathe, we all eat, we all benefit from the sun shining and the wind blowing and the rain that comes. We all embrace this universal good. And when you live your life with these principles of good, what happens is you start to see that your life gets better. And that's actually available for everybody. And what happens is then when you start to walk with God, when you start to follow God's direction in your life, what you start to notice is freedom, real freedom from slavery. And the Bible talks a lot about slavery. But I want you to want more than that, right? That's level one. Two, you've embraced the universal good. But really, to go deeper, to go to the next level, when you want more of a relationship with God, when you want to see more impact in your life, you got to go to the next level. And the next level is a personal relationship with God. It's about you being able to say the very simple prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. It's the kind of prayer that really changes your entire situation. It changes the way that you start to see the world around you. But, you know, if we want more, it starts with the idea that we're no longer slaves, that we have been adopted into God's family, that we are a child of God. That, Jesus, I give you my life to do what you want to do for me, the purposes that you have for me, as we heard earlier. That I'm no longer a slave to my passions or my past or my guilt or my shame or the addictions that I've had or the moment that I'm in or the emotions that just don't stop. That I'm not a slave to any of those things because the opposite of slavery is freedom. And that's what's available to each one of us. But there's another level. I want more. I want an even better relationship with God. I want to know what's next, what's even beyond that. And we started off in this passage in Galatians 4. I'm just going to read it here really quickly. But Galatians 4, it says, What I'm saying is is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to the guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when when we were underage... We were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship, because you are his sons and daughters. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. And so you are no longer a slave, but a child of God. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. We got to get free from slavery, and that's step one. We have to realize that we're fully adopted and that we are truly a child of God, and there's another level there. But there's an even better level when you start to really embrace that you are an heir. And what that really means here is it has to do with a right perspective, a close relationship, and something that changes your view on the world around you. In other words, it's something that we like to call spiritual maturity. Y'all heard that? You feel like you're spiritually mature? 
Paul goes on to say in Galatians 5, he says, It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In other words, it's, it's possible to get free and then step right back under that yoke. But when you truly embrace the fact that you are an heir, you start to get this different sense. You start to see the world differently. That's what I'm after on this next level of a relationship. I want to see the world around me the way that God sees it. More and more and more every day. To me, that's progress. That's growing in a relationship with God. That's me being made into the image of what God wants me to be in my life. And so I have a message for you as we talk about spiritual maturity. And this applies to everyone here. And you may not like it. You got to grow up. You got to grow up. Spiritually speaking, we have to grow up. Because a lot of the time, you see, we, when we talk about spiritual maturity, what are we even talking about here? Like, what does that even mean? What does it look like? How do we access it? Like, what does spiritual maturity actually look like? A solid faith and foundation? It's really about that all-access relationship with God. Not just the general admission, as we said, right? But the full access with God. It's the deepest level of a relationship. But what happens is sometimes in our world today, even among Christians in our world, we get so bogged down into this way of just powerless thinking that we start to feel trapped in our world that we're in or we start to feel like the walls are closing in around us. We feel like the culture is getting so far away from the values that we have that it's just pressing in and we start to feel pressure, 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 pressure. But what we should be feeling is freedom, freedom, freedom. You see, that's us going right back underneath the yoke. That's walking back into the slavery perspective. And so if we're going to have real spiritual maturity, it's being able to press beyond that, to see the world differently around us. You know, God wants you to have the fullness of this inheritance. If I tell you that you're an heir, it says something about your life, that, that you are not just part of what's happening here. You're not just like, attending the party, right? If I tell you that you are an heir, you are connected to the mission, to the purpose that God has. You are connected to what God is trying to do in the world. If you are an heir, you are invested. You have ownership. You want to see the things succeed. Not just sitting on the bench, no sitting on the sidelines. Every one of us here is called into action in our world today. That's being spiritually mature. And I just don't know. I mean, do we really understand a concept like that? It's really, it's hard to understand. Let me give you another example. When we start off, maybe it's just the level one. When we start a relationship with God, like if you today feel like your relationship with God is all about your obedience to the rules, it's like you're going right back into that. If the only way that you see God today is as a rule maker, and someone that is constantly watching and that you're going to get in trouble if you don't follow all the rules, right? Like, that's a base level, minimal understanding of who God is. And a minimal understanding, a misrepresentation of what God actually wants for each of your lives. And so what that means is that while you're free and while you're a child of God, you could be living like a slave. And if we don't grow and cultivate that spiritual maturity and that sense about us to partner with God's will for our life, to be a part of what he's doing, to trust him enough to know that his calling on our life is good and go with it. Sometimes we know that God's called us to things and, and we doubt that. And we, it's like we almost make excuses or we avoid the, the first baby steps that we got to do to go forward, the things that God wants us to do. And and really what happens is that's a lack of trust in what God wants for each of us. And so there should be some encouragement, right, is that there is this extra level. Because spiritual maturity, though, is a choice. So you don't have to. But do you know what you'd be missing if you don't? You see, spiritual matur physical maturity, right, like the people around us, you know, when you think about when you're growing, when you are a child or an adolescent, when you are a teenager, right? Like, maturity happens to you, right? All of a sudden, you hit the growth spurt. 
your voice starts to get deeper, you know, like that kind of maturity happens to you, but spiritual maturity, sometimes it requires a choice to go with what God wants to do, to see what God's doing in your life, to go with what God's called you to do, to take the little steps and let him really truly lead. It's part of that all excess pass. If Jesus said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom, if Jesus said, I've given you full life and full freedom, that you may have life to the full is what the scripture says, and we live a half a life, we're missing out. Jesus said, follow me. Let me lead your life. Let me show you how to make this world a better place. If we're spiritually mature, we start to understand that we are actually part of what needs to happen in our world today, that we have an integral role to play in the lives of those around us, that this is not just us happening to be here. We didn't just get invited to attend a party. We are part of the mission. We're part of the purpose. We're part of the direction that God wants for each of our our lives, helping to bring the kingdom to earth, on earth as it is in heaven. That kind of relationship with God is some next level. You know, you think about spiritual maturity, right? And we think about, you know, other things. And have you ever heard of Arrested Development? Not the television show. About the dysfunctional family and, you know, not that. No, Arrested Development, right? It's like being stuck at a developmental stage in your life. You know, right now in our society, a lot of the time we start to hear things that are kind of weird in terms of values, but frankly, they're just misrepresented. So here's a term. Let me throw this out there, and you'll see how these relate. Toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. You heard of this, right? Yeah. Can it be toxic? Yeah, definitely. But what's happening is we misunderstand what masculinity even is at the detriment of men in our world today. You know, as men, being a man and being masculine is a good thing within a godly realm, but there is this toxic masculinity, and what happens is, is that our culture has told us that masculinity is so toxic that it must be avoided at all costs, that we are on the verge of having an entire generation of young men that will have arrested development, and that will be the perpetual man-child. Do you know any? You know, when we think about masculinity and stuff like, or when we think about maturity, What you do as a kid is not always great when you're an adult. So, for instance, if as a young teen you love to play video games and, like, hang out with your friends and kind of just, like, zone out and just start binge watching shows and, like, eat a bunch of junk food, like, those things are not nearly as appealing when you're an adult and when you're 40. So what happens is, is you start to see, like, Our culture gives us these messages, they change our interpretation, and then all of a sudden what happens is we stop doing the things that help us to mature, that we don't have a fully formed perspective on what it means to be a man in our world today or to be a man of God, and that's not just about masculinity. That's an example, but it happens across the spectrum in our entire world today when our culture informs the way that we are supposed to live or the norms that are supposed to be there. That's at odds sometimes with our values, and that's really difficult for us sometimes. So how do we get out of that? How do we not get stuck? How do we not have the arrested development moments, and how do we, how do we progress, and how do we take that next step of wanting more of a relationship with God to make an impact in our world? I think a lot of it when we think about spiritual maturity, how do you have a different perspective? In other words, there's there's ideas that you can then have about the world today. Like, let me give you an example of a spiritually mature perspective. Church. A lot of the times, people, especially like as you first come to faith, it's like, okay, I met Jesus. This is amazing. What am I supposed to do? You got to read your Bible. You got to pray. You got to go to church, right? And what happens is, is that sometimes when people go to church, they think, well, I just go to church because it's just all about receiving. And what happens is we live in a consumer culture to where you get the church shoppers out there. And so they're visiting all the, and they're trying to say like, well, I don't know what this, what's this one going to give me? Do they have the amazing child care so that, you know, my kids are driving me nuts and I just need to go drop them off over there? Can, 
Is that an amenity that I can have? Whereas a spiritually mature perspective understands that us being called together as the church, this community that we have is about giving as well. It's about what we can bring. It's what we can do for others, right? When you think about what we do in this space here, we receive the word of God. We hear the gospel, the good news, God's grace on each one of our lives. We start to feel that transformative power. We connect to other people here. But when we worship and sing, that's an offering to God. It's giving. It's not just about receiving. You see, when we give, we receive. And that's kind of like one of those mysteries of the faith here. But spiritual maturity says, well, I'm not just going to skip out on church because I'm not feeling like I, well, you know, I I think like I'm kind of good today. But like I actually need to go because God might have something for me to do there today. And it might be as simple as just talking to somebody, finding out how their week was and offering a little bit of encouragement. Sometimes it's as simple as y'all talk to somebody who's having a tough time and say like, that sounds really hard. Like, hang in there. I'm going to pray for you. You know the kind of difference that makes in people's life? Spiritually mature. Spiritual maturity is also like that simple prayer of Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. Because what it's saying is, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus, I give you my life is saying, you know the plans, you have a purpose, and that's what I want most in my life. Not the desires that I have or the things that I think that I want or the things that I think are going to make me happy or comfortable, or have a sense of security, but I actually want, see, I'm willing to give that up. I actually want what you want for me. Jesus, I give you my life. My life is yours. Do something through me. That's spiritually mature. Or even just the perspective of understanding what's happening in the world around us and being able to see clearly. I regularly find myself praying that. God, can you just help me see clearly right now? It's so easy to get confused and to look at our situations and our circumstances, to look at the factors that are around us, to look at all of the different circumstances in which we find ourselves. And it's super easy for us to just kind of start playing the victim, feeling sorry for ourselves, right? Instead of doing the spiritually mature option, which is to take that responsibility and to to go to God and to see clearly what's he doing. In other words, God, if you want to make me a little bit uncomfortable because that's what you need from me right now, I'm for it. Jesus, I give you my life. That's a big one. It can really change your entire life, you know. And so if we go back to the Galatians passage in 5, it says don't return to the slavery, you know. Stop being a slave to your emotions and your desires to your brokenness, to your addiction, but let God truly transform you and live that purpose that he has for your life. I think it's time for us to grow up. We need to embrace our inheritance as an heir. In other words, that connectedness to the mission and purpose that God has for each of our lives. I think it's time for us to really embrace that in our world today because it's needed. There's an invitation in that, living connected. Like, when I think about the idea of that spiritual maturity, when I think about deepening my relationship with God, remember what Jesus told some of the disciples. He said, you'll do even greater things. Like, Jesus was doing miracles, okay? All the people that he healed, all the people who got set free, all the people whose lives were transformed and changed by a single word and a single touch from Jesus Christ. And then Jesus goes to the disciples, right? And we are, we are in that tradition. We are part of that, that inheritance, right? As heirs, we're part of that. And he says, what? You'll do even greater things than that. That's the kind of opportunity that's out there. I want that full life. I want that fully formed faith. I want to be the heir, you know? And are you going to do it? God's inviting you into that today. Are you willing to take those steps? It's not like you got to do something or, or make something or, you know, the pressure is not on you. It's simply to accept the gift of grace in your life. Because here's the thing. If we're going to do this, y'all. The gospel is not about me putting more pressure on each one of you and saying, like, 
step it up, you need to grow up. The good news of the gospel here is the right perspective that we're going to need some help, y'all. Anybody know what today is in the church calendar? Pentecost, yeah. It's the Holy Spirit coming back to the disciples when they're all gathered. Typically in the church, right, we wear red. You like that? I know a lot of you were like, wait a minute, this guy's deviated from his usual uniform. What's happening right now? This man, this man, I think most people probably just think my closet is like Steve Jobs looking, right? Like not turtlenecks, but just t-shirts, right? Just black t-shirts all the way across. But why red, right? Red is this symbol of power of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit comes as a rushing, violent wind in Acts chapter 2. That it blows into the room where they're all gathered, and then it goes from this tongue of fire, and then it splits up and goes above each of their heads. When the Holy Spirit comes, this is all about Jesus coming into our life. It's the helper that we need. It's the strength and power that we need in our life to be able to accomplish what God has for us. In Acts chapter 2, it says, when the, when the day of Pentecost came, they were gathered together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house as they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enables. And all the people, the crowd gathers, the people don't understand what's going. And all of a sudden, Peter starts preaching. And let me tell you, it's powerful. Because he's empowered by the Spirit of God. You know, we've got to look at a Hebrew word here called the ruach. Can you say that? Ruach. It's a good one, right? Because you kind of got to like get into it to say that. It's a biblical word for spirit. Wind and breath. This is a really interesting word because when you learn this one, right? Like you're only going to learn one word. This I think is one of the best. As you start to read, there's some connection between God breathing into the dust to form the human. That God's spirit enters in. That the Holy Spirit within us enters as a violent wind. That it blows and breathes on all of us. And when I think about that, right? That's a beautiful perspective of what the Holy Spirit does for us. The truth is that we need the Spirit. And as I was reading in this Galatians passage, I noticed that actually one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible, Romans chapter 8, so much good stuff in it. And it just echoes exactly what Paul is saying in Galatians. But... The, the perspective here is life in the Spirit. In other words, we're going to need some help. It says in Romans 8, 14, says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, and if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Paul is now talking about what it means to live life in the Spirit. That the Holy Spirit comes and we need that helper for us. We need that empowerment because sometimes we can feel drained, we can feel weak, but we need the help. And sometimes it comes in a gentle breeze. Sometimes it comes in a violent wind. But the Holy Spirit is the offer of God's presence with each believer. The next section that he has in Romans 8 talks about suffering and future glory. That he says, I consider that our present sufferings are nothing compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. And that we know in all things that God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, maturity comes out of struggle. It's in the middle of the struggle and in the middle of the storm that we find ourselves stretched and that we have to grow. It's in the suffering. It's in our moments of weakness. It's in the struggle that we find the kind of maturity that God wants for each of our lives. And that's purpose. We get connected to that as heirs in the inheritance of God. And then in verse 31 it says, Well, what then shall we say in response to all of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
And then it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword, fear, or disappointment even? And it says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Not your desires, not your addiction, not your brokenness, not your trauma, not your past. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God. But it's time for us to grow up, you know. You have a choice to make today. The invitation of God for each of you in your life is to choose. We can choose to be doubters or we can choose to be believers. We can choose to see the worst around us all the time or we can choose to see the best in the people that are in our life. We can choose slavery or we can choose freedom. You see, the choice really is ours. And I want to choose to be the best. I want to... I wanna, grow in my belief. I want to grow in my freedom. I want to grow and be more impactful in the world around me. I want to see it clearly that all of those things, the trouble, the hardship, the persecution, the suffering, that none of those things get in my way because I know that none of that can keep me from the love of God in my life and the power of the Holy Spirit within me. You know, it's been an interesting week. Melody, you said that. That was great been an interesting week because there's a lot of events happening. I had a couple of incidents this week I wanted to talk about because spiritual maturity means looking for the God moments in your life. I just happen to have a couple. It was on Wednesday. I had an Uber ride, okay? And I met this guy named Robert. It's great. I get in the car. He's listening to KSBJ. I'm like, oh, cool, right? Friend. Awesome. He's listening to the Christian radio, right? And I say, I was like, oh, yeah, this is KSBJ. Oh, that's really cool. I like to listen to Air One, too, right? Not as great reception in town, but great worship music. Love it, right? And so we just start talking. And he's a personal trainer, Robert. He's a personal trainer. But he's going back to school, and he's talking about how his kids are giving him a hard time about his grades, which is kind of funny. What are your grades, Dad? You said we got to get good grades. Where are yours? He's going back to school because he wants to be a counselor. And I said, oh, that's really great because... That's a real connectedness, like personal trainer into counseling. Sometimes you got to, like, motivate people, tell them what they don't want to hear, tell them, like, stretch them, push your boundaries, right? I was like, oh, that's really great. You can do that. We start talking about church. We start talking about ministry. We start talking about toxic masculinity in the culture today and all these things, just in, like, a 20-minute conversation, you know? And, you know, at the end of the conversation, you know, God bless, have a great day, you know, I, and I... I I tried to encourage him and said, like, I think you're going to do big things. This is really important for the church, right? In the church, we know that that's so important for us, helping people get free. And, you know, I got out of there, and then I was like, you know, that was kind of weird, but, like, I didn't, I didn't tell him I was a pastor. And I was like, I feel like I probably should have, right? Like, I should have said that. I mean, I should have told him my church, right? Because, like, he might, he might have come, right? So I was kind of kicking myself at the end. I was like, you know what? No. This situation, like, This was a God appointment for me. For some reason, this guy came. We had this amazing connection. He might just show up here one day, y'all. Right? Not even knowing. Like, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to see Robert again. I don't know where, but I'm going to see this guy again. Because I think he's going to be doing something for the kingdom. You see, he was thinking about counseling from a worldly perspective. And then all of a sudden, he started seeing like, oh, oh yeah, that could actually help people in the church too, huh? That might have just happened in a car ride randomly. He may just think, like, this guy is kind of weird or whatever. I don't know. But look at what God might do in just a simple moment like that. Let me give you another another instance this week. We had a little bit of a weather event. Y'all remember that? A little bit. We had a lot of people without power. Anybody not have power right now? Okay. We got a couple. All right, y'all. Activate right? Church, activate. Um, We had some people, but when I think of that intense, what was it? It was an intense wind came through. When I start reading Acts chapter 2 about a violent wind, that's, in my head, 
That's the kind of thing I imagine. Like it's coming in sideways and taking things out, you know, like the power of the Holy Spirit and the rushing wind, the violent wind, it says. But that was an opportunity for us to see, you know, wow, this is scary. And it was. And it was all of a sudden just right on top of us, like, whoa, where did that even come from? And, and everybody's caught by, hey, y'all, if there's a hurricane, we're good at that. We got like three days to prepare. There's a disturbance in the Gulf. Let's start, you know, doing all the things we do get out of town, whatever. But, you know, for this one, it just happened. And then look at how people got so rattled. Look at how their anxiety went through the roof. And that's people that weren't, didn't even lose power and weren't really affected. But just that edge and that, that not understanding what the opportunity of the moment is, which is to help the people around us. I think what God wants in those moments is for us to come together, to still have the faith in the middle of the storm. If a storm like that blows in and your entire worldview gets rocked, of who God is and what God has for your life, that's not a mature faith. That's shallow roots is what the Bible says. I'll give you another example. Saturday morning. Anybody remember get up early Saturday morning, have to drive? Couldn't see nothing. Remember the fog that it was here? I mean, like, visibility was, what, like five feet or something? Everybody's driving, like, five miles an hour, right? Like, I remember opening up the garage, and I see it's misty outside. I'm like, whoa, what's happening, right? Is there a fire next door or something? It's like just, and I just, I kind of see it falling. And I'm like, is this rain? Did, did the sky just meet the earth today, this fog? But when I think about the Holy Spirit, the wind, the breath, there's a really good thing that I've had y'all do before. Just put your hand right up to your face. Just breathe through your nose. You feel your breath on your hand? You know, God's closer than that. When I saw that mist come down, I was like, that fog, right? And I was like, this fog. It's kind of beautiful because, like, that's how close God can be for us. God is so close in our life, like, like just right there, tangible, present in our life. In fact, I was thinking about how sometimes... Walking with God, sometimes God probably blinds me to things that are going on around me because probably I don't need to see them. Like if I'm walking with God and trying to walk in the Spirit, what happens is like, I'm not really worried about all the extra things that are happening, the things that don't actually impact me. You see, I can maintain a singular focus. I can know what God wants for my life to try and see the ministry moments that are there and present, but that God is not just some idea. God is not just some, like, nice concept Christianity is not just some nice version of a concept among a ton of other options that you could just pick from for a general, generic spiritual path. The path of Christianity is different than anything else this world will teach you because what it teaches you is that the Spirit of God is with you. Not just do whatever you want and do what makes you happy. Right? That's a message we get all the time. Oh, what was it? Follow your dreams? Follow your heart? It could be anything you want to be, literally anything. But the message of Jesus says, God is right here with us. And so for today, it's time for you to take the next step. If your next step right now is just embracing the good, take it. That, that God has good things for you and that God can help you get free of the slavery that you're under. If your next step today, your invitation is to, Jesus, I give you my life. To really start to understand that personal relationship, that, that you know him, that you talk to him, that you spend time with him. Take that step. But if you're there and you find yourself getting pulled off and you see that the storms just rattle you, the frustrations of life pull all your focus away so that you don't see what God's doing, so that you get taken out of the battle that's here, the invitation for you today is to go deeper and let Jesus empower your life. It's to take that next step forward. It's to choose to grow up. Because there's more to a life with God than just the bare minimum. What God wants is life to the full. And so it's time for us to take the next step. If we're going to be heirs, connected to the mission and the purpose of God, if we're going to live a life that is all in, I want to be all in, don't you? Life that is connected and directed. We've got to choose to grow up. We've got to choose to see clearly. 
We've got to choose to give everything. We have to choose to live for God. We have to choose to let the Spirit lead us in our life because it's here for you today. That's your invitation. Amen.